It's competitive. Let's see. Looks like he's got some news here. But if that doesn't work out, then um, applying for jobs. Yep. It's good backup plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's see if he's got any news here. Oh, it's going to be live? Yeah. Okay. Looks like we're going forward. Great. Okay. Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds good. I'll just look out. <laughs> yes. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Perrin Duncan. I'm a senior economics and studio art double major here at DePauw. I'm from Edmond, Oklahoma. And I'm ex so excited to welcome you to tonight's virtual session of Alumni College. Our faculty presenter tonight is Dr. Mike Seaman, Assistant Professor of Classical Studies. Michael Seaman earned his MA and PhD in Ancient History from UCLA. He has taught Ancient History and Classical Civilization courses at DePauw since 2004. Recent courses include Ancient Warfare, Ancient Athletics, Greek Civilization, Roman Civilization, and Greek Mythology. He is taught in the first year seminar program as well as the honor scholar program where he re regularly teaches an upper division class entitled Democracy and Imperialism in Ancient Greece. Michael often takes students and alumni abroad to study and travel in Italy and has also taught Italian for the Modern Languages Department and courses on the Italian Renaissance for the History Department. This June, Michael will be leading an alumni trip to Tuscany. So check the alumni website or contact the alumni office for more, for more information on that. Michael's research focuses on ancient Greek and Roman history, in particular archaic and gra classical Greek history, Greek epigraphy, epigraphy, ancient historiography, history, historiography, and ancient military history. His studies of ancient warfare have appeared in the journal Historia as well as in edited volumes published by Oxford University Press and Wiley Blackwell. He is currently finishing a book entitled Ancient Greek Siege Warfare from Homer to Alex Alexander and is editing a book forthcoming by Brill on asymmetric warfare in the ancient world. Michael has pre presented his research at the annual meetings of the American Historical Association, the Society for Classical Studies, the Classical Association of the Middle, West, and South, the Classical Association of the Atlantic States, the Association of Ancient Historians, as well as international conferences. He was recently the recipient of the Bernadotte E. Schmidt Grant from the American Historical Association for Epigraphical Research in Athens and Sparta. Michael has served on the Writing Curriculum Committee and currently serves as advisor to the Rector Scholars. Students awarded DePaul's preeminent academic scholarship. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Seaman, who will present on the foundation of the Florentine Republic and the creation of an ideal city. Thanks very much, Perrin. I guess I don't need that. So, um, the relatively small city of Florence produced an astonishing array of genius in the Renaissance. A great period of cultural change that began in Italy about 1400 and ran for 200 years. Uh, in the words of one scholar, John Plum, um, no city of so small a compass has ever before or since made a greater contribution to art and letters within a brief span of only 150 years. Now Florence was the cradle of the Renaissance and for a period of over 100 years, Florence led Italy and Europe in painting, sculpture, philosophy, and sophistication. Scholars have often asked the question, why did the Renaissance start in Italy and why in particular in Florence? And I'd like to look at this question tonight and also explore how some key economic and political 
uh, developments in the city resulted in significant changes to the physical topography of the city of Florence. And that these changes helped turn the city itself into a work of art. So I'm going to back up now to the beginning of uh, Florentine history briefly and then run through some key changes in the Middle Ages. Florence was originally a Roman city called Florentia and was probably founded by Julius Caesar in 59 BC as a settlement for his veterans. Uh, it was founded along what was known as the Via Cassia, which ran north through Tuscany, as you can see there on the map. Roman cities were built on an orthogonal plan when they were founded as a colony, uh, that is a, uh, like a grid pattern. And they had two main uh, roads that ran through, the Cardo Maximus, which ran north-south, and the Decumanus Maximus, which ran east-west. This is a reconstruction uh, in a nice museum in Florence. It has a nice model of the town uh, as it was throughout its various periods. And this is the Roman model, and you can see here in the center, the Roman Forum, where those two roads would meet. That today is the, by the way, the Piazza della Repubblica, the center of town, still a large meeting center in, in, uh, in town. Uh, Florence was never a large or wealthy city in the Roman period, but it was uh, at a significant point along the Arno River, which facilitated trade uh, south to Rome. And you can see that here. In the early Middle Ages, uh, from 400 to 1,000, um, it used to be called the Dark Ages, when uh, there were lots of invasions. You had the fall of the Roman Empire, and you had wave after wave of Germanic tribes coming in, including the Ostrogoths. You had the Byzantines there for a while, the Lombards and the Franks under Charlemagne. And for a time, the population uh, uh, shrunk quite a bit, down to probably about 1,000 people in Florence. But then in the High Middle Ages, from about 1,000 to 1,300, the population began to grow again. And like most cities in North Central Italy, around 1,000 or 1,100, uh, it, became, it became an independent state. The town prospered in the 12th and 13th centuries due to an increase in commercial activity. And this included many kinds of artisans um, especially wool production. For some reason, uh, Florence became uh, the greatest center of wool production in Europe. And it was one of this brought it, it made it one of the richest cities in late medieval Europe. By the time uh, that the Black Plague hit uh, Europe in 1348, the population had risen to over 100,000 people. And about one quarter to one third of those were working in the wool industry. Florence, unlike many other great towns of the time, was not a seaport. It was not a great seaport. It was not one of the rich cities that made huge fortunes as a result of the Crusades, like Pisa and Venice and Genoa and Amalfi. Um, a lot of the money flowed through those cities uh, to take, uh, they were ferrying knights over to the Holy Land and the Crusades. So you could say it was at a bit of a disadvantage there. Also, <coughs> it had a disadvantageous geographical position <coughs> with the West being controlled by an enemy, Pisa. Uh, they also sat on the Arno, and so the route out to the sea was blocked by Pisa, as well as one of their other uh, perennial enemies, whom they never conquered, Lucca, another town over there. Um, to the south, there was Siena, uh, which controlled the road to Rome, uh, also gave them trouble in warfare. And to the east, they had the Papal States. They were very warlike, these Papal States. So therefore, the Florentines needed to be, if they were going to be successful at this time, they needed to be resourceful. And it would be their industriousness and their wealth that would allow them to survive and flourish. The prime source of Florence's strength and wealth were the guilds. And these were associations of merchants and skilled craftsmen. Uh, and the most important guild was that of finishing wool. <clears throat> the making of wool and cloth was the largest industry in medieval towns. And this was a group of merchants in the guild that would go up and uh, find uh, the wool uh, in England and Flanders and other places in northern Europe and bring it down and, and finish it in, uh, in Florence and uh, dye it these wonderful, uh, brilliant colors, which the people in the Renaissance and, and late Middle Ages really liked. You can see a lot of these in those paintings from the, from the Renaissance, like this one. Uh, and then they'd export it all over Europe. <coughs> so wool was really the engine that drove the Florentine economy. And we know that by 1300 uh, in Florence, there were between 200 and 300 wool shops. So in the 12th and 13th centuries then, Florence grew into a mercantile power. And it grew in mercantile wealth. So that in the late Middle Ages, we see in Florence the emergence 
of a wealthy mercantile class. This mercantile class provides the economic foundation that allows the Renaissance to happen. With the emergence of this class, we start to see an increase in trade with a new class of merchants in turn uh, that causes a number of developments. For instance, we start to see lawyers and legal codes. Merchants, of course, needed notaries to drop all their contracts, and the idea is to facilitate long-distance trade. We also see coinage. Uh, the Florentine florin um, emerged at this period. It was, a, uh, was introduced in 1237, and it was the city's gold coin uh, that gained international standing as one of the most reliable currencies of this time. In fact, uh, it was used all over, uh, all over Europe, uh, including Eastern Europe, and uh, the fact that uh, most uh, trade was quoted in Florence, as well as the Venetian ducat, uh, uh, facilitated, uh, gave some advantages to the city, let's say, just like the dollar does to America today. We also see the growth of secular education, unlike the rest of Europe, where education was really a monopoly of the church. Uh, so elsewhere, you had to really be a cleric in order to get a good education. Um, the mercantile economy in Florence dictated that these merchants needed a good education. They needed to be trained in math uh, and accounting, uh, in reading and writing. You needed people to drop all these contracts and trade agree agreements and bills of lading and things that went along with all that trade. And this would, of course, facilitate the mercantile economy. And then lastly, we see also city councils uh, become more sophisticated. They had to regulate the trade and needed to, uh, to grow in sophistication in order to do that. So I'd like to turn a little bit now toward uh, medieval Florentine politics, <coughs> which were dominated by old noble Florentine families. By 1350, Florence had been already a self-governing commune for two centuries, but it was really in the hands of a small oligarchy of very wealthy, uh, important families. And so it, and, and they didn't govern very well. It didn't enjoy great stability. It was ruled by a series of councils whose members were drawn only from these leading families. Uh, and so we had an old ruling class of wealthy landed aristocrats who dominated the politics. They were, uh, they were known as the magnates or the magnati as well as the grandi. The magnates were these old landed uh, aristocrats who had descended from the uh, feudal lords, the, the knights. Uh, they were very powerful, had big land estates. Uh, and the grandi were the... Uh, the first very wealthy merchants who had intermarried with them and adopted all their prejudices. And, and, uh, and so these were the, the folks who controlled the politics. They dominated the city councils and the highest courts. Well, this left the mercantile class disenfranchised. Um, they were conspicuously left out of this political setup, even though these were the ones who were really driving the economy, you could say, uh, paying a lot of the taxes. And some of them were just as wealthy as these, of the, as these nobles. But the government was closed to them uh, because it was, it was uh, carefully kept in the hands of these leading families. So, th so they had no political power that was commensurate with their influence, and uh, the ruling class was simply just unwilling to give it over to them. In many cases, uh, some of these uh, ruling aristocrats um, had known some of these wealthy. They were, you know, their, their parents, the parents of the new mercantiles, were uh, serfs on their estate, and now all of a sudden they're... they're uh, owning the mortgage on one of their palaces in, uh, in Florence. It's very difficult for them to accept this. Oops. Uh, and I mentioned how the nobles really didn't manage very good government. They were very unprofessional in their handling of the cities. They didn't really care much about all the contracts and things. It's, it didn't really didn't interest them uh, to balance the accounts. Uh, and so as a result of this, Florence became a very dangerous place. Um, these old noble families fought with each other for political dominance. Uh, they often brought their wars into the city. They had a tradition of kin loyalty and defending family honor. Uh, even if you, were, uh, if you had a perceived slight against your family, you would get your kin to go and, and attack uh, the family or the, the other kin that had attacked you. you this is the, the world, you could say, of the Montagues and the Capulets. And by the way, those were two Italian families in Verona, the uh, Montecchi and the Capuletti. Uh, and they're, they're mentioned by Dante in the Purgatory, I think it's Canto VI, uh, for, for really causing a lot of strife in the town of Verona. So the tradition of the, the, the noble feuding uh, families uh, had turned Florence into a very dangerous place. And it was essentially a battlefield um, among these families 
Uh, and mo uh, there were many of these towns that had this problem. You had the Guelph Ghibelline conflict, which was which added to it. But Florence was notorious uh, for this. And this, of course, is not not very good for trade. Uh, you couldn't go on long distance trade, thinking your your place, your warehouse, would be burned down uh, while you were gone. And not to mention that it would not be good for your quality of life. So the, these ruling families erected towers in the Middle Ages to give themselves an impregnable fortress, a kind of a refuge from the law where they could flee to. They would, uh, they would contract out what are called tower societies where they would uh, make an alliance with other families, uh, either through a uh, contract or, and some of these contracts, by the way, survive from 1100 or so, uh, or through marriage or some sort of business uh, where they could uh, dominate a neighborhood. They had the underground tunnels from one tower to the other. And so if you looked at a medieval skyline, it was strewn with these spiky towers. And you can look at this map here. Somebody's actually tracked down uh, in the 13th and 14th centuries where the towers were. Um, this shows over 60. Uh, we do have a letter from a man uh, describing what the city was like to his son uh, from, thir from 1378. And he says, and in the, in the said city of Florence, there were soon about 150 towers belonging to private citizens, each 120 braccia. And that's a, uh, you can say it's a foot. It's a, basically, it's an old form of measurement, your, your forearm. Not counting the towers on the walls. And because of the height of the many towers then in Florence, from outside, both at a distance and close by, it was said to be the finest and most splendid city of its region. And it's hard to imagine <coughs> what 150 towers in a small town like Florence would look like. Uh, although we have some scholars in Italy now working on this. You can see this digital reproduction uh, of Showing, you know, showing the towers in Florence, the principal towers and palaces uh, around 1250. Um, and you can get, you know, the, many of the towns later would, would rip these, out, rip these down. Um, although there is one town in Italy that still preserves a lot of these, and that's San Gimignano. If you were to head to Tuscany, I'd always encourage you to head to San Gimignano, which is a very pretty town, UNESCO World Heritage Site, where they preserve about 15 towers uh, still standing. And you can climb up one of them, as a matter of fact. I take the DePaul students up there in the summer. Uh, one key event in Florentine history takes place at the end of the 13th century then. Uh, what we see is that the mercantile class, which has been disenfranchised until now, uh, stages essentially a coup d'etat. The guilds were led by what were known as priors. The prior was someone who managed the trading operations of the guild throughout Europe. And there were seven of these major guilds, so there were seven priors. Um, and the priors began to take the responsibility over from the city to letting out contracts on behalf of the city. So you know, remember you had these noble families who really weren't interested in doing this anyway. They just were more interested in, in fighting amongst themselves and in balancing books. And so they allowed the priors to sort of take over letting out these contracts. One of the contracts they let out was for the Podesta. The Podesta was the main general of the town. He was always a foreigner because the, the uh, noble uh, cities, the no, sorry, the noble uh, families wouldn't trust any other noble family to give him the power of the military uh, for a year uh, or, or they wouldn't trust any uh, family uh, to do that. And so they would always bring a foreigner in to lead the armies and the militia. And this Podesta had, had the highest magistrate of the Florentine city council. And if the, f if the foreigner did a good job, uh, if they felt he balanced the books at the end of the year and, and led the armies well, he could put up his insignia, his coat of arms, um, inside the Bargello Palace, which you can see that that was where he worked. And you, if you go in there today, today it houses a, a lot of the famous sculptures uh, of the Renaissance. But then it was uh, where this uh, Podesta had his office. And you can see there in the courtyard a lot of these these coats of arms. Uh, today it does house uh, Michelangelo and, uh, and uh, Donatello and others. So these seven priors then um, were elected by the major guilds, the seven major guilds, uh, stated that they would now manage the affairs of the state. And they were essentially allowed to do that by the leading families. Mostly this consisted of signing contracts and balancing accounts. Um, but they'd have to do it by consensus. So this is very different from uh, and, they, and they got along really well. They, this, some, that's what they did as, as businessmen, whereas the uh, leading families couldn't do that. And so they ruled fairly effectively. Um, and then on tw in 1293, January 18, an event takes place that uh, 
changes Florentine history forever. And this is when the Priors institute a series of statutory, uh, sorry, of, of statutory laws known as the Ordinances of Justice. And it's through these Ordinances of Justice that the Florentine Republic is born. Uh, they create a Republican constitution that would rule Florence through most of the Renaissance. And they created the context in Florence uh, for the Renaissance to take hold and flourish. What did these ordinances of justice do? Well, I have the first point up there. They widened the participation in the government. They brought all property owners into the government. Uh, in addition to the seven guilds, they were going to invite in, as, as the seven great guilds, they invited in the 14 lesser guilds, uh, so-called arti minori. And these were the traditional craft guilds, like shoemakers, and they weren't the especially good guilds, the, the higher guilds, like banking and wool uh, and, and lawyers. Uh, these are vintners and innkeepers and uh, shoemakers and things, but they uh, they owned property and uh, they paid taxes and they worked in a guild and so because they met those conditions now they were going to be involved in the government. This was not a, uh, a, a widespread uh, democracy you could say because uh, many people were left out. Of course you had women left out. You had people who were landless who were left out and many of the workers in Florence, in fact the majority of Florentines, who were not in a guild and they were not allowed to be in a guild, they were left out. However, uh, by, let's say, 13th century standards, this still, even though you only have, let's say, 5% of the population uh, having access to political office, is still a, uh, a significant percentage, uh, f let's say, by 14th century, 13th century standards. So now anyone who owned property and was in a guild uh, was eligible, even for the highest office in Florence, such as a prior. So that's one of the things they did. And the second thing is they uh, enacted some anti-magnate legislation. A number of the magnates, particularly those who were uh, very uh, violent, were disenfranchised. They could no longer run for office. Uh, it was thought that they were too violent. Some of them were expulsed from the town. Their palaces were uh, torn down. Um, these vendettas were bad for the city. They also subjected the magnates to penalties and, re oops, I thought I had that a point on the slide. They also subjected the magnates to penalties and restrictions. The head males of the noble households had to post a bond, essentially, for not just himself, but everybody in his extended kin. So that if anybody in his family, even the extended family, misbehaved, uh, he would forfeit the bond. And so now the law is really uh, strong enough to come after uh, lawless uh, noble families, let's say. They were used to just uh, ignoring the laws and going to their tower, um, but now they're lo they stand to lose something and be severely penalized. So the ordinances of justice then transformed Florence from a, let's say, an oligarchical government uh, that had been dominated by a few traditional uh, powerful families of the nobility into a, we could call it a guild republic. Um, and it essentially, it's a, it's a greater participatory republic in which a larger percentage of the population of the property owning, let's say, a large percentage of the property owning population uh, or class could hold office. And the merchants had now become the dominant class. So the political power then shifts from the aristocrats to the mercantile elite, and it worked quite well. Um, the Florentine Republic lasts for about uh, 240 years uh, before it finally succumbs. Uh, and it's, it's, it, it does get dominated for a while in the, in the 15th century by, um, by the Medici family, they, they sort of dominated, but it does last quite a long time, which, you know, in Italy at the time was experimenting with a lot of different kinds of government and the republics were not all that common. So now we start to see changes in the landscape of Florence. After the founding of the Republic, we can say that the topography changes dramatically as a consequence of these political changes. One of the first things they do, um, these, this new mercantile government, is to destroy the towers of the nobles. <coughs> As we've seen, they have these huge fortified compounds um, with, with large towers, and they essentially tear a lot of these down, or at least they institute, where, where they, when they don't tear it down, it can only be a certain height, uh, about uh, 29 meters, which is about 90 feet. This meant that there were no more, uh, if you're gonna look at the symbol of the town, uh, it's not going to be all these spiky towers anymore. Uh, they're all brought down to a, a much l lower height. Uh, and this has a practical effect, of course, that you're, you're allowed to govern those people now. But also it has a sort of symbolic effect because it meant that the symbol of the city was now uh, no longer private towers, but it's going to be the public towers. And 
the towers that would rise then in, in the near future are these governmental towers which represent public power in public hands, not no longer private hands. <coughs> in fact, if you walk around Florence today, and this is true for other towns too where they took down the towers, you can see a lot of these examples of the shortened uh, towers. Um, these are just two of them. There are a number of them in Florence and other cities as well. And if you look at this, this is a map that comes to us from the 15th century, and it's a, it's a pretty accurate map for what it looked like back then. And what you don't see are a lot of private towers. <coughs> we also start to see the rise, the creation of public buildings in space. We had to have a building for the public government now. Um, until now, the government was in the hands of these noble citizens, and it took place in the palaces of the noble citizens. But now we're going to have a public building for the public government, and so uh, there had to be a public building. And so they brought out the great architect uh, Arnolfo de Cambio, um, who was chosen to build this. And he builds this Palazzo de la Signoria <coughs> in the center of town. The palazzo actually was built over the ruins, or I guess they demolished uh, another palace of the Uberti family. This is one of these uh, powerful noble families who had misbehaved, and they decided they were going to take his land and expel him from town. He's also mentioned by, by Dante as being extremely violent. Um, and they tore down his palace and built this palace instead, as and also built the, uh, the uh, piazza there as well. So now this is going to be a public space where the Republic carries out their affairs. <coughs> and once the priors are elected, uh, they move immediately into this building and their uh, office is only good for two months. Then they have to have a new election. They didn't trust them long enough. Uh, that, that is the, the more important the office in Florence, the shorter the span of office was. Collectively, the nine priors, they, they eventually moved it up to nine from seven. Uh, they would choose some from the three from the best, the top guilds and then uh, uh, five from uh, the lesser guilds and then one from sort of the mayors of different neighborhoods. Collectively, they were known as the Signoria. This, this is why the building is called Piazza della Signoria. And uh, the Signoria just means a lordship or basically the government. And you have that tower there, which is, is interesting. And it's not really just an architectural embellishment. It's not there by accident. It's meant to show that the power of the city now is in the hands of the public, no longer in private hands. So it's, it represents a symbolic moment of a political reality. <coughs> the huge piazza in front also of the, uh, this, was, this was the site of the Berti Palaces, and uh, it's now going to be a public space for all citizens to enjoy. And uh, there it is there. Uh, and it was adorned with some of the most beautiful uh, works of Renaissance art, like Michelangelo's David, which you now see a copy of it out here on front over here. But uh, the originals in the museum, but uh, as well as this lodge over here, which houses a lot of other art. We also see the rise of religious public buildings at this time. There was also a need for religious public buildings. The idea of the community in the Renaissance was it was a Christian community, and there was a need for uh, the city to have a Christian uh, place of Christian gathering, and so uh, architects were brought in to build the great churches. Um, and I'm just going to show you a couple of slides uh, of a couple of churches, the Franciscans and Dominicans, the great preaching orders in particular. Uh, but first, they, they build a new uh, cathedral of Florence, <coughs> the most famous building in town. <coughs> the old cathedral, Santa Reparata, was a paleo-Christian. It was a very early Christian a building, quite small, not really, um, not really good representative of uh, the wealth and power that Florence had now attained. <coughs> it was far too small for this huge growing city. And so they built a new one over the old one. And again, Ar Arnolfo de Cambio was brought in. Uh, and even by today's standards, <coughs> this is an enormous church. Uh, and it was to be a symbol of the Republic. It was to be uh, a symbol of the power uh, of uh, Florence and the values, the spiritual values of the Florentines. And it was to represent the wealth and size uh, of this great city in the Renaissance later. The great painter Giotto added the bell tower. Um, and uh, later on, you know, the, when Arnolfo designed it, he, they didn't have the ability to build the dome. <coughs> but he knew that uh, 
this could be done. Uh, he, he could look at the dome in Rome, for instance, in the Pantheon. He knew that another large one existed in Constantinople, built by Justinian, Hagia Sophia. Uh, and so he, he arranged for a dome to be put there at some point when they could figure it out. So actually it went for over 100 years uh, without, a, without a, a dome, a flat roof, until Brunelleschi, Brunelleschi eventually builds the dome. And you can see uh, it's not very impressive without the dome. They also built, uh, and here's the Duomo for those of you who've been to Florence. I know many of the audience uh, have been there. And a look at the dome. <coughs> Architectural wonder. Without scaffolding, he built it there. It just still dominates the city skyline. Uh, the first of the two great preaching churches, Santa Croce, which is the Franciscan church. Uh, this is probably designed by Arnolfo again, although that's disputed. Um, it's a huge preaching church uh, uh, to allow for the huge crowds that gathered there. And remember these preachers at the time, they could get pretty good crowds. Uh, and this large square out front as well, <coughs> which is still used today when they have reenactments of these medieval and Renaissance uh, games. This is a soccer match, actually, or a very brutal kind of uh, violent soccer match that they hold there. Santa Croce down here closer to the Arno. And then lastly, you have the Dominican Santa Maria Novella, uh, which also has a large piazza. You can see it there. Um, so both of these churches have large public squares in, in front of them. And so you have these three squares now, really, in Florence, which, um, you know, if you're a despot, <coughs> you don't really like to have these great public gathering spaces because the people uh, might come against you. And so you don't have these. But in a republic, uh, you like the people to gather for various reasons, and you don't fear them this way. And so that's why you have these wonderful squares. So we can say that this architectural remaking of the city was all undertaken in the immediate wake of the founding of the Republican Constitution, in just a few short years after, uh, they, uh, after they made that uh, mercantile coup d'etat. Although a lot of this architectural building will go on for many years, including uh, even uh, more than a century. There's a look at inside Santa Maria Novella. <coughs> so uh, let me just say some concluding remarks here. Florence then begins to take on the image of how it would look in the Renaissance, and really even today. There's a look at that piazza out front of Santa Maria Novella. Um, in fact, uh, the city, it, it, it turns from something like this, where you have these private palaces and towers all over the place into something like this. And it really is a work of art uh, at this time. So we see these major changes in the physical topography. And uh, now the towers are the churches, uh, the cathedral, the Bargello, and the tower of the Palazzo of the Signoria. So after the Republican Constitution, the skyline is transformed dramatically. And these beautiful buildings are a reflection of the success and the wealth of its citizens. And this goes right back to the Constitution of 1293. Now, one last thing I want to say is that Florentines now begin to see themselves as the ideal city-state, where the freedom of the individual is guaranteed and where social mobility was encouraged. There were a lot of different uh, ways, I mentioned earlier, for, for Italians and Europeans to govern themselves. Uh, Florence only needed to look north to Milan, where they had a series of dukes, all powerful dukes, uh, who would control uh, up also up at Urbino. They also could look south uh, to uh, Naples, where you had a king. Uh, of course, France and, and Flanders and uh, Britain and Spain, they all had monarchies. Uh, but Florence did not. And in fact, Florence was attacked, uh, was, was uh, uh, almost uh, taken by Milan, uh, as well as Naples, but they survived. And they felt like this was um, the will of God, that somehow God had favored them. Uh, they have divine protection this way. Why? Because they have this republic and they're free. <coughs> and so it's, they, they saw this as a mark of divine favor and protection. And with its republican constitution, they, they find this affinity with Rome. Um, they look back to Rome and they see, hey, this is just like us, a republic. And Rome, of course, you know, started as a monarchy, but it had 500 years as a republic before it reverted back again with the emperors to the monarchy. And so they imagined Florence as the new Rome. 
and Florentines as the heirs to ancient Roman greatness. And this helped fuel uh, the recovery of antiquity in the Renaissance. You study uh, the, Republican, uh, the Republicans of Rome because Florence was Republican, like Rome, uh, and it's just like the Rome of Cicero. So if you want to be effective in politics, you want to learn the rhetoric of Cicero, just as Cicero did in ancient Rome. And so you study up on Cicero and all the rhetorical tricks. And this, this will not just be impressive, but it will also help your city. Because if you're effective in your speaking and your policy, then the city will take the right decisions in government. So Florence becomes a collection of individuals with a shared set of values, which can be applied to the building of a better life on earth. It was through its Republican government that the Florentines created a city that was itself a work of art. They wanted to show the world what freedom was and how beautiful it could be, and they succeeded. So that's, that's all I've got for today. <coughs> Thank <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Seaman. We have a question online from Bob and Sally Carpenter up in <coughs> Chicago. Hi, Bob and Sally. They ask, what does Dr. Seaman view as the role and impact of the Medici family on the political, social, and cultural development of Florence? That's a very good question. Uh, <coughs> and it would require a very long answer, which I'm probably not prepared to say, but I'll say some things. Um, there are a couple of Medici rulers who were uh, significant and had a, a major impact on politics and art in Florence. And uh, this starts, of course, with Cosimo, the Ve Cosimo il Vecchio, they call him Cosimo the Elder, uh, who was asked at the end of his life, uh, he, they said, gee, you're spending a lot of money. And he, he apparently said, well, I've spent my life making a lot of money and spending a lot of money. And I'm, I, I really enjoy spending it a lot more than I do making it. Uh, and in fact, he spent a lot of money. He, he was a patron of many art artists, uh, in fact, an architect as well, Michelozzo. He brought him in to, to uh, create his palace in the middle of town. We're told that, there's kind of a funny, funny story about this, he, was, he, he commissioned a, a palace. He, they were bankers, of course, had a lot of money. He commissioned a palace. In fact, they were, the, they were the, probably the wealthiest individuals. He was probably the wealthiest indiv individual in, in Europe, even wealthier than the Pope, wealthier than the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, he had he was he was loaded, uh, and he uh, brought in Michelozzo. Well, f first he commissioned this this uh, palace, and we're told that he said, "No, no, this is too big. I, I'm just a simple citizen. I need something more simple." And then he built this gigantic palace. So it, you kind of wonder, gosh, what was the first plan like? Uh, this uh, this one, the Palazzo Medici Riccardi, it's known as in the center of Florence. It takes up a whole city block. So you know, and it, and it became sort of the standard palace that you would build in the Renaissance. There's a few of these that survived, really beautiful palaces in downtown Florence from the same period. Uh, but so he, he, he patronized Donatello and, and a number of great artists. Uh, he also built the first library in Florence. Uh, he, uh, up at St. Mark's, um, and he, he donated a lot of his works. He had over 300 people. Uh, is it 300? He had, an, uh, I think it's 300 people. I don't think I have it in my notes. Uh, just transcribing texts uh, to, to make his library bigger, ancient texts from the Greek and Roman world. Uh, but this library, he opened up. Anybody could go in, borrow a book uh, for free, uh, any Florentine citizen. So, uh, and this is another thing, you know, the, the impact of the Medici I is great. And uh, you, you had to think that even the lower classes, they did, they did revolt, it was something called the Chompy Revolt, um, after this Republican government. But they, they, this was put down, and they never revolted again. So you could say it was kind of a rare exception in the long period of their uh, of the Republican Constitution. And and people ask the question, why did they revolt again? Well, probably because you know these folks, if they were suppressed somewhat, of course, but they did enjoy uh, living under uh, this great city at this time, where wealth was being spent. People were patronizing. They would go into these churches and see these amazing frescoes, and 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 be proud to be a Florentine. Uh, um, but uh, getting back to Cosimo, then uh, he, politically he had a big impact as well. Even though he never had a position in the government um, officially, uh, we're told that the, he, he was behind the scenes making a lot of decisions. Nothing really got done without his approval. Uh, in fact, there's a letter from the Bishop of Siena to the Pope who complains that nothing gets done. Uh, it, all, the, all the key decisions in Florence are taken at the house of Cosimo and Medici. <coughs> that, uh, if it's peace or war or any, anything needs to be done, it's done there in, behind closed doors in his house. He is, he says in the letter, he is in all but name a king of the town. Uh, I think that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but uh, 
we're told that he was able to get his men into the key positions and so uh, and he was well loved by the people in fact he was kicked out of town he was he was almost killed uh, he had some supporters save him he would certainly have been executed because he was on some trumped up charges some political enemies but he had he was so generous with his money he, he would loan out lots of money to poor people in town uh, people need loans and he said look you know don't bother if you can't pay me back you know i may need a favor in the future um, so and people loved him in fact uh, when he was exiled they demanded he be brought back into town so uh, so they had a good they had a big happen lorenzo magnificent his grandson also a great uh, patron of the arts michelangelo and <coughs> leonardo and a, f a number of others were, were patronized by him in fact were, he, it's estimated that he spent uh, th I think it's 360,000 florins. Uh, in fact, the bank, uh, the Medici Bank, uh, uh, was in terrible shape when he died. Uh, but 360,000 florins I on, on uh, patronizing in Florence, and that is the equivalent of about $500 million. So the impact of the Medici's, uh, you know, some people think, well, these guys were kind of tyrants. I, I, I tend to come down on the other side and so, say, you know, this, they, they had such an amazing impact on the city and on the Renaissance in general that uh, it's hard to, to deny that. So that would be how I'd answer that question. Dr. Seaman, you are leading some alumni trips to Italy that have just been wildly popular. I've received rave reviews from alums who have been on these trips. I wonder if you could just tell our audience a little bit about uh, where you've taken our groups, maybe a, a preview of the trip this summer. Sure. And yeah. I'd certainly welcome any uh, viewers online who are interested in those trips to contact Great. us and join what's been really a wonderful journey for our alums. Well, I know some of the folks yeah. who traveled are, are tuning in. Uh, yeah, we started, so my, Francesca, my wife and I, she teaches Italian and a few other things here. Uh, we, we take the past students to Italy uh, every year and uh, up to the Northeast and we've led a few tours up there in the Veneto and the Friuli region, Venice and the Dolomite Mountains and uh, some interesting towns, maybe a little off the beaten path towns uh, founded by Julius Caesar and uh, Lots of UNESCO World Heritage Sites up in that area. Uh, not many people have heard of that area, so this year we decided we're going to take people to uh, Tuscany. Um, and we'll see, again, a mixture of uh, major important towns. We'll see Florence and Siena and Pisa. But a few towns off the beaten path. We'll see that San Gimignano with all the towers. Uh, Volterra, uh, known for its alabaster production. We'll go down to, uh, we're staying actually in a castle um, in the Chianti region. Um, it's a luxurious castle from the 11th century. Uh, so it's, it's first class uh, accommodations uh, for six nights and then we go two nights and many, many people consider it the nicest hotel in Florence. It's, it's a, it's a Westin hotel known as the St. Regis. It's their upper line hotel. Um, we, d we dine in castles. Uh, we, we go to Michelin starred restaurants. Um, all wine and, and uh, most of the food is included. So it's, it's a well thought out tour. Um, studied it pretty, pretty well. Uh, went down there twice this year to set up this tour for next year. So. I feel pretty confident it's a, it's a really high quality tour. So um, yeah, come with us if you want to come with us. Uh, it's, it's, it's nice, that what I've found is that the alumni like it for two reasons. One, it's, it's mostly DePaul alumni. They, they of course can bring their guests. And uh, secondly, uh, it's academic. So I, I lecture, I've got a room in the castle where I'm gonna give slide lectures on the history of, of uh, the Renaissance and of the cities we'll visit. I have a lot of handouts. Uh, we also have some tour guides that add along the way. So, uh, yeah, it's, it should be a fun time. Great, great. Uh, we have another question online from mm -hmm. Andy Reith, class of 1980. Thank you, Andy. He asks, could you speak to the decline of this advanced city-state? Are there analogies today as we see the evolution of modern cultures, states? Well, let's see. <coughs> um, Generally, uh, the decline sets in. Um, what you get is a strong man that comes along and takes the power. Um, you know, in the case of, let's say, uh, Pisa. Uh, Pisa um, was a republic, a maritime republic, that was battling with Genova for a long period and uh, had, had usually been on the, the d defeated side of those battles with Genoa. And, uh, that set them up for a conquest from uh, from Florence eventually. And um, with Siena, they were a republic, long independent from uh, Florence, a longer republic than Florentine Republic. And they were defeated by the Spanish uh, king. 
So, and this is, you know, speaking of city-states, you know, we can go back to ancient Greece for this too. You had all the ancient Greek city-states. What happened there? Same thing. You had uh, Athens and Sparta and all their allies fighting this great war in the Peloponnesian War, a 27-year-long war, after which they fought a 10-year war called the Corinthian War, uh, after which there were just endless fighting amongst themselves. This coming after they got together, uh, that one brief moment to defeat the Persians, but followed by all this infighting, which set them up for an outside conquest by Macedon. You know, Philip II, the father of Alexander the Great. So, I guess I'd say if there's a pattern, it would be uh, internal weakness for some reason, and uh, and then uh, wasted resources, wasted manpower, uh, weakening you to the extent that you fall prey to an outside source. So, I if we're going to say that this will be repeated in this country, let's just play a game here and say what would happen in the future if we look 50 years from now. We can say, well, uh, if the uh, if the example holds, well then uh, we'll see America weakening itself, um, setting it up for an outside conquest, you know, say to China or Russia or something. You know, maybe, maybe something like that. that. That would be. Is there a modern parallel? Maybe not yet, but you know, I, I don't think it's that far flung. Uh, there was a gentleman, uh, Francis. I think his name was Fukuyama. Back in the 80s, he wrote, a, he wrote an essay called "The End of History," where he argued that most of the world is. Uh, has now seen the light and uh, we've all become democracies and democracies tend not to fight wars against each other so therefore we've reached the end of history. This was Fukuyama's theory and I as a historian I have to say I'd have to reject that because uh, we never get to the end. Things are always changing uh, and actually if you're going to look at the government, uh, what has been the favored government f of mankind since the beginning of the world, by far you'd have to say it was a monarchy. Uh, not that I'm advocating monarchy but I just think as history marches along, uh, people's uh, preferences change, uh, and uh, you know, a democracy is kind of a rare flower in the garden of political uh, history. You, you had democracy. I always find it fascinating. It's one of, the, uh, uh, one of the great ironies or coincidences of, of history is that you had democracy founded in 508 B.C. in Athens and the Republic of Rome founded in 509 B.C., essentially the same year. Uh, but So you had democracy in ancient Greece, democracy in ancient Rome for a while. Uh, before monarchy took over again, and you had it in these city-states a little bit, a little form of democracy, and then you had it again in 1776, and you have it now, but that's it since the beginning of time. So, uh, I know I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, but um, I don't, I'm not sure I answered the question all that well, so write in again if, <laughs> if you have a follow-up. <coughs> Hi, sure. so uh, my name's Austin. I'm a freshman here at DePaul, and I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about how um, Florence either changed its <coughs> attitudes and views on religion and specifically Christ Christianity or how Christianity kind of like changed Florence because you talked about how early on it was a pretty secular education um, and also it wasn't really regionally very great for the Crusades but obviously as we look at this cityscape um, it's dominated by you know churches so uh, I just didn't know if you could speak about that a little bit. Yeah Florence is a little unique in the sense that they they had a kind of a crisis in the Renaissance so uh, they considered themselves of course Christian um, and then when the Renaissance really took hold in Florence um, there was there was a uh, a couple of movements I didn't have time to get into it really but there were a couple of movements that that uh, developed um, there was a dilemma in the Middle Ages where uh, someone who was making a lot of money, um, you, you, you know the passages in the Bible, a good Christian would know this uh, in Florence, he would think, well, uh, you know, the, the camel has an easier time passing through the eye of the needle. Um, and, uh, and there are a few other passages as well that they, they took to their heart. And of course you had St. Francis in the 13th century out uh, preaching poverty. And, and uh, so they, on the one hand, they, they were making all this money you know, Florence would be very wealthy. Um, in the Middle Ages, what, what would you do with that money? Well, you'd, you'd maybe give it to a church or found a monastery. Uh, you'd sort of give it back to God. Well, in the Renaissance, they, they developed something called civic humanism where they were actually giving it to the city. And uh, they thought, well, yes, it's true. I'm making all this money. And you have the idea in St. Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages that you must, make a ju you must have a, a just price. And they knew these were not just, but they were making a fortune with this stuff. But they could justify it in the sense that they were making the city uh, beautiful, were 
were, they had a few other things that they had uh, started. For instance, they had a, a fund for dowries when somebody couldn't afford a dowry. All you had to do is when you had a daughter, put a little money in there, and it would pay an interest. And when it was time for the girl to get married, you bring out the money, you had a nice dowry. So they, they were, it, was, it was really uh, forward-thinking people. Um, so on the one hand, you had this, this dilemma, but they were able to sort of resolve that by saying, well, we're going to spend the money for the good of the community. Uh, on the other hand, um, they really adopted, in the Middle Ages also, right at the beginning with Christianity, you had a kind of a dilemma. Should we be reading these pagan texts? And a lot of church thinkers thought, you know, I wouldn't touch that. We got every, in fact, Tertullian, the famous, uh, uh, let's say, uh, doc, not a doctor of the church, but a ch church father, you could say, a very, very prolific writer in the early church. Uh, he said, uh, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? Uh, I have everything right here with Jesus Christ and the gospel. Why do I need to read all that, you know, Aeneas and Dido and Homer and Odysseus and Achilles? You know, that's dangerous. And, uh, and in fact, there was a pagan emperor um, after the advent of Christianity, there was one pagan emperor, and he, he proclaimed, this is Julian the Apostate, uh, he said, uh, no Christian can teach pagan texts anymore. It's not your text, teach your own texts. And so there was this sort of, uh, there was this, this thought that it was, it was a little, there, they were, um, insecure a little bit. They, they knew that, you know, these texts are not the great classics of the pagans, you could say. Uh, but fortunately, the, there were other people who thought, you know, it's kind of like a minefield. You know, you, you've got, you can read it, but you've got to be careful. Uh, but you could appreciate it for what it is. And so fortunately, that won out. So they, we have these texts today. They, they, they went ahead and had the monks copy the Middle Ages. So there was this, and so in the Renaissance, when we went back to appreciating the ancient texts, they actually went on hunts. They went around monasteries looking for, and they rediscovered lost works of Cicero and other works. Um, there was a, some in Florence who thought, you know, maybe we've gone a little too far with this. God is going to punish us, and uh, we're too pagan. You know, we're this is too much. We're, you got Botticelli. I don't know if he said this, but you know, he's out there painting Venus instead of the Madonna, and so uh, and nudes. They're painting nudes. the first nude statue since antiquity. The first equestrian statue since antiquity. They did a lot of firsts. Although I have to say, you know, there was. Donatello sculpted a statue in bronze. It's in Padua uh, called uh, Gattemelata. It's this, this uh, kind of a mercenary general from Venice. And um, he, he, was, he was looking at the statue of Marcus Aurelius, the great equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius, sits in Rome. It was in front of the Campidoglio up there in the Palatine Hill. And that was the only bronze equestrian statue to survive from ancient times. You can see it today in Rome. And the only reason it survived is because they thought it was Constantine. They thought it was the first Christian emperor. And actually, it, what's interesting is that it was these scholars in the Renaissance who were able to discover, no, that's Constantine, because they were looking at coins with, with Constantine's images. That doesn't look like him. This looks more like Marcus Aurelius. And they realized, hey, this is Marcus Aurelius. But had they known, it never would have survived. They would have melted it down, made cannonballs or whatever. Uh, so that's right. So then Donatello takes it as a model, and he sculpts, for the first time in over a 1,000 years, the first uh, equestrian statue since Roman times. Although, if you look at Marcus Aurelius, he, it's, he's, he's got this horse prancing, he's got one foot up, the horse is, his first uh, foot, high, hoof is up, and uh, Donatello couldn't figure out how to do that. He couldn't figure out how to balance the horse on three feet. It's a lot of weight, all that bronze. And so he had to put a, a cannonball underneath the, <laughs> the foot that's up. And about, uh, about a generation later, they, or two generations later, they figured it out, but, uh, but uh, they, they were just the genius of the ancients. But so uh, there was a man in Florence, his name was Savonarola, and he was a preacher. And he was one of these guys who, who really got some traction in Florence. And he thought that we've gone too far. We need to repent. We need to, uh, he, he was actually the famous bonfire of the vanities, come and burn all these books in the piazza of the Signoria. Eventually, um, he was executed. <laughs> he was burned at the stake there. And there's actually a little stone in the piazza where you can see where he was executed. So that's, yeah, a little bit of a long answer. Well, thank you, Dr. Seaman. This has been a wonderful uh, tour through Florence. I want to go back. Hope I can get on one of those trips myself. Yeah. But uh, it's been a, a we'll great evening. Thank you so much for sure. sharing you your it's perspective been a pleasure, with yeah, us. Real pleasure. And uh, say hello to everybody out there who's listening. And so great. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you.